Hello once again, everybody. Thank you for joining me here on this Tuesday, September 15th edition of ATS.io Radio. I'm joined by Brian Blessing, the host of Sportsbook Radio and Vegas Hockey Outline. We're going to talk about some week one to week two overreactions. Talk about some of our favorite picks for week one, at least early on in the handicapping process here. And we'll take a look at the U.S. Open at Winged Foot as well. As I mentioned on the betters box, I wanted to do both audio and video here for the segments with Brian. We still have a lot of audio listeners, and we're just growing that ATS YouTube page following. So I want to make sure that we did the audio version here as well. So this is my reminder to head over to ATS.io. Check out everything that we have going on. I've written up a U.S. Open preview for this week at Winged Foot. Written up some NFL content for you as well. And we're covering the top sportsbook promotions in the industry to go along with our sportsbook reviews for the legal U.S. sports betting landscape over at ATS.io. So as I said, I got one guest today, and that is Brian Blessing from Sportsbook Radio and Vegas Hockey Hotline. And we're going to do a highlight video here of our thoughts on some week one to week two overreactions in the NFL betting market. And Brian, I guess first and foremost here, before we get into the overreactions, yep. week one, I think we kind of saw sort of what we expected, even though we didn't know what to expect with no preseason, no OTAs, you know, not a traditional lead up to the season. Still felt like things kind of played out as we anticipated. Yeah, football was football, Adam. That was the thing. It was, it was going to be an odd dynamic, but uh, I thought the quality of the games was very good. Um, I think the one thing that remains true, and it will play into what we're talking about, uh, the overreactions, and I think we could do this actually every week because uh, the numbers are more volatile now on a week-to-week basis than they've ever been in the past. But I also think the cautionary tale is some of these teams uh, come out of the gate and look good and good for them. Some of the teams that just spit the bit, I mean, maybe in Indianapolis, a handful of teams, that for whatever reason, the transition, and, and maybe Brady and the Bucks. although we, I, I, I know we talked about it last week, I love New Orleans, and it had nothing to do with what was going on on the field. It was just New Orleans is like, we're sick and tired of hearing this. Brady this, Bucks that, we're the gold standard in this division. That was kind of an intangible thing that actually played out right. But I think there are going to be teams that start 0-2, and, and it may take us some three, four weeks for a team to really say they got their act together, and that's who they are. In the past, we kind of know who these teams were and what they were going to accomplish from a power ranking perspective, usually by week two. I think, again, this is going to take a month. I think some teams are just going to be ridiculously slow starters and find their groove. That's an excellent point. You know, this is, like we talked about last week, week one to week two is traditionally the biggest overreaction week. At the same time, with no preseason, limited OTAs, limited contact, and all of that, Mm -hmm. I guess you can make the case, you know, if you're going to call it an overreaction from week one to week two, you have to come up with some sort of concrete opinion as to why something would be different. Because right now, I sort of look at this and I go, well, if a team looked, you know, this way in week one, why would it be any different going into week two? I think maybe this year more than others, it is fair to ask that question. No, again, there's like a learning curve for us. I think there's a learning curve for the teams. And then the other thing we should take into account are the new coaches, the new quarterbacks. um, And it's just going to take them a while. And uh, I, I, I think we'll get a read on this in a couple of weeks, but for the most part, I got, I'll throw it back at you. I was pleasantly surprised. I, you know, I, I didn't notice any intangible difference. I thought maybe the road teams, well, we had what the six dogs went out, right? Uh, I believe, you know, I thought the road teams with the lack of crowd noise would be more efficient on offense. And I don't know that we necessarily saw that out of the gate, but I would say this. I'm not letting go of it because I think, generally speaking, the majority of situations would be the defense would be ahead of the offense when you first start facing live bullets there that I think that may still rear its head here in a couple of weeks because I think not only are teams collectively not what they're going to be yet, but specific units on football teams aren't going to, you know, I think offenses could get you know ridiculously better here in the next couple of weeks. I I just think there's still a lot to watch and and try to decipher. 
Yeah, I think that's true. And, and I think in some of these games too, um, you know, not all of them, but some of them, we saw the defenses get a little bit tired in the fourth quarter. Uh, I think there were, what, 38 points in the fourth quarter of Green Bay and Minnesota. We saw a lot of points in the fourth quarter mm-hmm. of Washington, Philadelphia, where that was kind of Washington's pass rush really starting to take over. I think that was your point last week. Uh, and I, I remember saying, oh, but don't forget, uh, Tennessee's going to altitude. Boy, that was just a knockdown, uh, drag out defensive battle. But I think it was your point last week, the tackling could be suspect, and then in the fourth quarter, fatigue set in. If the fatigue sets in, the offense kind of knows where they're going, and the defense is slow to react because they're trying to figure out what they're doing. I thought that was your point last week, and I think it, it rang true in the fourth quarter. So as you look at the week two spreads here, and again, this is you know the main point here of this highlight video, I know you and I have a disagreement on the first game that I think is an overreaction. So we'll start with yours before we wind up with some back and forth on mine. What's a game that you're kind of looking at here this week where you look at the number or maybe you look at kind of where the number is going and say, this feels like an overreaction based on the one data point we have from last week? Uh, I think there's several. I think Green Bay laying six to Detroit with a caveat. I mean, Detroit had the game in their back pocket. And then, you know, we're, we're doing this video the morning after the Golden Knights got eliminated in the Stanley Cup playoffs. And clearly the Golden Knights didn't watch the Lions game. And the Golden Knights are up 2 nothing, eight minutes to go, and they sat back. And instead, of they stopped playing and started protecting. And that's a nightmare. And Detroit did the same thing. Chicago comes back, grabs the lead. To their credit, Stafford takes them down the field, and dramatically they're going to win the game, and Swift drops the pass. Now, it's a punch to the gut for Detroit, but they were ahead the whole game. And, yes, Green Bay up and down the field. There was no defense in the Green Bay-Minnesota game. And, yes, uh, the Packers' offense looks sensational. But it's a, it's a Detroit team that, that lost the game. But if you really go inside the box score – or you, it's not in the box score that Swift dropped the pass where they'd have won the game, or for three and a half quarters they were just beating the hell out of the Bears, I think that's an overreaction. I think I think the Packers should be about four, four and a half. I think, six. The, I think the one caveat I'd put on that game is Detroit's secondary is in bad shape. They didn't have Jeff Akuda last week. They lost two corners during the game against Chicago, which kind of opened the door for the Bears, but – like you said, I mean, if DeAndre Swift catches that ball, you know, the, the Lions wind up covering anything under three at that point in time, then, you know, what, what does this line look like? And you can and, the and, and, the other, and the other thing, and I neg- forgive me, I neglected to mention, and now even if he comes back, he's likely not 100%. But don't forget the Lions did that without their biggest offensive weapon, Galladay, uh, who had a hamstring and didn't play. So... You know, A, if Galladay played in that game, B, if he plays this week, there's a guy, and skill position guys aren't really worth anything in relation to the number, um, but this could be a guy who should be worth a point, a point and a half, if he plays. So that bears watching, too, during the week. Well, and, and not to say that this line's an overreaction necessarily, but, you know, the Thursday night game with Cincinnati and Cleveland, that one's down from seven, seven and a half to six. You know, if Cincinnati wins that game, if Joe Burrow makes that throw to A.J. Green, if Bullock makes the field goal and they wind up winning in overtime, something like that, that line on Thursday night looks different. And similarly, the line for the Chargers probably opens higher than it did, where now it's been bet up to Chiefs minus eight and a half going out to the West Coast, take on the Chargers. You know, the Chargers escaped with a win, didn't play well, but they won the game. So, you know, they mm-hmm. kind of got a little bit of a, not a head start necessarily, but just a little bit of a you know preferential line in that game against the Chiefs See, just because they won, but they didn't play well in that game. More more of this game, the number would be, hey, boy, Burrow played well. It was all dink and dunk stuff. You know, he had A.J. Green down the middle for a touchdown, and he overthrew him. He had one chance, and then they had the touchdown pass on the short out, and it was offensive pass interference, and then they missed the field goal. So, but everybody's like, Hey, Burrow looked pretty good, and Cincinnati competed. So you're sitting there, and you say, do you give marks to Cincinnati? But is the real question, how ordinary are the Chargers, right? I, you know, there's the other side of the equation here. I think at some point you're getting Herbert in there. 
I don't know when that comes. You win the game, Taylor's going to start. But you watch the Chargers, and in that game, their offensive limitations were run full display. Now, for the Browns, that game is just draw a line through it. To me, that game didn't even happen because it was that was one of the best bets of week one. We talked about it. Harbaugh always wins the preseason games. You know, he's, he's a fast starter. He's a historically fast starter. And if you look at the Ravens' scores in week one in recent years, I mean, they maul people. I think they put 47 up on the Bills like three years ago in week one, and the Bills went on to have the second-best defense in the league. Yeah. So the Ravens are, are incredible out of the gate. So now people go, oh, the Browns. That was just a buzzsaw. I mean, to me, it's almost like the Brown season opens here. Well, the game that we're going to disagree on here, I want to make sure that we touch on this one while we've got this video in terms of week one to week two overreactions. I think the Buffalo-Miami line is an overreaction. You disagree with me. I'll give you the floor in a second here. But yep. you know, for Miami, look, I'm going to go ahead and say it. And I mentioned this yesterday on the show, and I'll say it again here. A guy I really respect, Rob Pozzola out there on Twitter mentioned in his Sunday Periscope that he believes the Patriots are better with Cam Newton than they were with Tom Brady, at least the current version of Tom Brady that we've seen. And I completely agree with that. And I think Miami had no idea what to expect. I don't think they knew there would be so many design Cam Newton runs. And I mean, they lost by a respectable margin in that game, obviously didn't cover the spread. Buffalo blows out the Jets who are tanking for Trevor. They're going to get Trevor Lawrence going to a race, whatever this development was with Sam Darnold. Buffalo did what they were supposed to do against a bad team. I give them credit for that. But I think Miami last week just ran into a Bill Belichick-led Patriots team that had the perfect game plan. The defense played well. Newton ran the offense well. I give Miami a much better chance here this week against Buffalo. I do, too. I mean, you know, it's on Fitzpatrick to play better, but that's what he does. He's awful one week, and he can beat you the next. But years ago, when I worked at uh, LVSC, the odds-making company, we would do, like, integrity and security reports. And you would sit down, and you would look at a game, penalties, turnovers, time of the – you would put the whole box – you would dissect the box score – and then come back with what the score in the game should have been. You know, if you were looking for red flags, you know, which, you know, we never, really never found, but, but that's what you were looking for. And I'm telling you, the Bills beat the Jets 27 to 17. If you didn't watch one play that game, you're like, okay, Bills did what they did, you know, won the game, division game. If I was doing that security report today, the final score of that Bills game, should have been 45 to 10. I mean, they were up 21 nothing. The offensive coordinator, the ball's a box of rocks. You're up 21 nothing, and he's running designed running plays. It's one thing for Allen to scramble, but they're doing designed running plays with your franchise quarterback in week one up 21 nothing. Are you trying to get the guy killed? He gets hit and fumbles. They're in, in the red zone. It's 24 or 28 nothing right there alone. Then they get it right back. Jets can't get a first down. They go in. Now they they get in. They stall. Chip shot field goal. Rookie kicker m- misses the kick. Uh, then they get it again. They come to another design running play for Allen. He gets cartwheeled, fumbles. There's another touchdown or field goal they left off the board. And he, I think he threw a pick in the end zone. I mean, they left so many points on the board. And then the Jets couldn't get a first down. So it's 21 nothing, and Darnold throws a jailhouse blitz. They sent everybody. He throws a three-yard out pass, and two Bills defenders come up to tackle Crowder and collide, and Crowder runs 80 yards for a touchdown. So a game that at that point should have been about 37 nothing ends up being 21-7. Um, Allen looked great. They got to do better with the running game. Diggs is a real weapon, and... He's played well down in Miami. Listen, I'm telling the odds makers, I think, got this one right because the Bills didn't beat the Jets by 10. They beat them by 30. I mean, it it really was a dominant performance, Adam. And if you didn't watch 10 seconds of the game, you're like, oh, the Bills just won. No, the Bills killed them. 
Well, these week one to week two overreactions, definitely very important here. We'll be talking about some more in a couple of minutes here on ATS.io radio with our week two uh, top picks that we've got early on here in the week. But make sure you subscribe over on our ATS.io YouTube page. And of course, you can subscribe to ATS.io radio on Spreaker, Stitcher, Spotify, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, anywhere you get your podcast content. So, Brian, again, it's it's one of those things here where you know the market lighting up early on in the week. And before we talk about our favorite plays for week one or for week two, excuse me, I just want to ask you about this. Are, are you feeling any more confident with how this bubble has gone so far about betting earlier in the week for the NFL as opposed to kind of waiting things out? Well, I think on an annual basis, uh, it's not only who you like, it's when you like them. You know, if you want to get the best of the number. So if you form those opinions, because I think, you know, there are a number of these games in here where we're pretty certain which way a number is going to go. I, You know, uh, other than the cross-country travel, I mean, I, the, the Jets were an atrocity, and then Le'Veon Bell got hurt. Um, San Francisco kind of a must, not a must, well, maybe it is in the NFC West out of the gate. You don't want to go 0 I don't know. Is that a number? that gets through seven by kickoff? I mean, is that a game, do you think, by the end of the week gets to seven and a half? I, I, would, so. I would wait. I don't I don't right. think it's coming down. Yeah, I no, I, I agree. I, I think you can you – know, injury reports are going to be very important. I mean, there were a lot of guys hurt going into last week. A lot of guys got hurt last week going into this week's games now. And also, too, you know, you've got these COVID situations that may pop up, but – they also may not. And I think if you expect, like you mentioned with that 49ers Jets game, if you think six or six and a half are going to be gone, mm-hmm. I think it's a risk you're willing to take to take that six and a half. And of course, now we see seven painted across the board. So I agree. I think if you've got relatively complete certainty that a line's going to be on the move and move either two or through a key number, I think it's worth, you know, that risk of, of you know, grabbing the, the, the best of the number that you can. And by the way, one that maybe we should have talked about, I don't know that it's necessarily an overreaction, uh, but the Chiefs at the Chargers uh, is a number that skyrocketed up to eight and a half. And it's a division game, Chiefs on the road. You know, if, is it a track meet? I mean, in, can Tyrod Taylor quarterback head-to-head with Mahomes in a track meet, I think it's it's correlated, right? I mean, it's Chiefs and over. Uh, but if the Chargers are winning that game, uh, isn't that clearly, uh, doesn't that have to be an under game? I mean, Tyrod Taylor is not going to win a shootout with Patrick Mahomes. Right. And, in fact, we see that total coming down quite substantially. It was which up would, to 50. Go ahead. W- well, which would indicate then that, as the week goes on, and I think sharp money will start to come in. I don't know that it ever gets down to seven, but if the if the money is start is starting to come in on the under, then it's the money's going to come in on the Chargers because that's it, this game is absolutely cor- correlated. The lower the score is, the better the Chargers' chance. Well, let's take a look here at our week two picks in another highlight video for our ATS YouTube page. But like I said, I wanted to make sure I had an audio component here with a lot more of our listeners, too, Brian and I, uh, picking up the podcast as opposed to the videos. But as we look at week two here, we've talked about some overreactions already. We've talked about some of the different things we're looking at and a lot of movement out there in the marketplace as well. It's Tuesday. A lot can change. Injury reports still have to come out. And, of course, the worst-case scenario with, you know, potentially some COVID tests with travel and all that. But as of Tuesday here, Brian, early on in the week, What are you kind of looking at as some of your favorite plays for week two? Uh, Part of me looks at Dallas minus the four and a half. Uh, We always have that home road dichotomy with Matt Ryan uh, and the Falcons. And Russell Wilson shredded them. He's a mobile quarterback. Dallas loses a tough one to the Rams. They don't want to start 0-2. I know a lot of people really like the Cowboys' chances to be really something good this year. I don't know that I'm willing to go that far, but I think in this instance, I think Atlanta's Atlanta again. Um, They're both 0-2, so there's a level of desperation. But going with the home road, Brian Falcons dichotomy, I'd I'd probably, you know, I'd stick with that for starters. That's one I'm looking at. 
I mean, Dallas, you know, they moved the football against the Rams right. to a certain degree. I mean, obviously, Aaron Donald kind of did his thing and well, was and, a disruptor as always. But well, that, Listen, that Rams defense with Donald and Ramsey, that's a hell of a one-two punch. It is. And and the thing about it, you know, there was a lot kind of said on Sunday night uh, across Twitter and social media about, you know, seemed like there was kind of a disconnect between McCarthy and Kellen Moore. And those are things you can smooth out over the preseason. It's hard to do it on the fly in week one against an actual NFL team and a pretty decent one at that in the Rams. So I know you kind of liked a little bit last week. So I think Dallas having some positive regression to the mean here this week. I think that's a pretty good look. I think I'm probably going to fade Tom Brady in the Bucs again here. I, I kind of liked a lot of what I saw from Carolina. Now, I know they didn't play very good defense against the Raiders, and defense will be a problem for Carolina as they go forward. But, you know, when you've got a guy like Christian McCaffrey, you've got to use him. They don't use him on that fourth down play. Maybe that game winds up differently if Carolina converts that first down in that fourth in game situation. And Tampa Bay, you know, I don't think Tom Brady played particularly well. I think Bruce Arians was a little bit too critical of him in the media. And we know Brady and Belichick had this great rapport, this great working relationship. Brady's trying to figure that out on the fly there uh, with Tampa Bay. I thought there were some throws that he missed. I was worried about some of the throws he made downfield. Tampa Bay still doesn't have a great running game. I think Carolina can hang around there as that number starts to approach 10 I'm not taking it at nine and a half because I think 10's a possibility. Uh, but if I have to settle for nine and a half later in the week, I, I Carolina's on my short list here this week. Yeah, the short week for both teams, so the, the playing field's level. But um, the Denver-Tennessee game, the play calling for Denver just dr- drive you crazy. I mean, um, I, I, I hate when these teams have a, you know, the, the third and three and they burn clock and it's like, you know, to keep it, no, get the first down, it's third and three, get the first down, you win the game. Instead of making them to take the timeout, get the first down, the game's over. But I think Denver is sneaky okay. Uh, their defense played their heart out and did a great job, I mean an exceptional job, uh, defending Derrick Henry and Brown. I And honestly, I mean, where's, where's, uh, where's Tennessee going this week? Because that offense, I think, still has the ability – uh, to become electric, but I kind of think De- Denver catching a touchdown against Pittsburgh. I think Pittsburgh was fine and serviceable, um, you know, beating the Giants. But I, I think that's a kind of a punch in the mouth kind of game. I think Big I'd be taking. I- Big Ben got hit a little bit in that Monday nighter, and and they even had Mason Rudolph on the sideline with his helmet on, potentially coming into that game, and. You know, I mean, again, that Denver team, look, I'm not a big Drew Locke guy, but now we're talking about a spread of seven and a half with a total of 41 and a half. I mean, look, if you think it's a low scoring game, then why can't Denver hang? Yeah, no, I I, I think they might. The other one, I'm, I, don't, I don't know what to do with it. And that's Jacksonville beating Indy and it's like I've never been a Philip Rivers guy I just I've gave Frank Reich the benefit of the doubt maybe they do figure this thing out uh you know Minnesota's defense was a travesty I mean maybe that is a high scoring game but take it to the other side of the coin albeit it's just the short week for Tennessee uh but Jacksonville gets that win I don't think Jacksonville's that good and I think Tennessee doesn't want uh, – they get Henry going in this game. And I think Tannehill's got the weapons. That could be a sneaky one. We're like, hey, the Jags won week one. I mean, I, part of me – nine-point number here. Part of me wants to say Tennessee can win this game by, like, you know, name the score. I, I think so, too. I, I agree with that one. And for Jacksonville last week, you know, you kind of look at some of the advanced metrics in that game. You know, Jacksonville – Gardner Minshew had windows to throw. Indianapolis did not cover well at all. If Tennessee covers well, Jacksonville is a a very, you know, risk averse. They're not an explosive offense at all. They're trying to get the ball to LaVisca Chanel as much as they possibly can, which makes sense. I mean, Jay Gruden's trying to put it in the hands of his playmakers, but if Minshew doesn't have all that room to throw to open guys because Indy just didn't cover well, then, I mean, Indy won that box score dramatically. They, basically doubled up Jacksonville in yardage. Indianapolis never punted in that game, and they still found a way to lose it. So Jacksonville, 
did get fortunate last week, uh, to say the least, and maybe that is a game that you come back on the heavy chalk. One more that I want to talk about here, and then we'll get to some U.S. Open stuff. New Orleans and Las Vegas on Monday night. I I wasn't impressed with the Saints. I took the Saints in the Circa. They got to the window. I know you liked the Saints a little bit last week as well. Drew Brees didn't look good. I mean, he had, like, what, 97 passing yards through three quarters of that game. He had no downfield ability whatsoever. Now Michael Thomas is hobbled after getting his leg rolled up on late in that game. Um, You know, they used a a lot of Taysom Hill, and and maybe that's something they do a little bit more going forward here. But the Raiders, you know, look, was it pretty on Sunday? No, not at all. But they got the win. And a lot of people aren't high on the Raiders for this year, and I can understand why. But a lot of continuity from last year's team, I think that's enough for them to hang around here in this Monday night spot against New Orleans. Actually, I would okay. I didn't make a great case. I I would lean to the over, and we're looking at fifty one, even with Thomas out, because I think you know we've been sitting here thinking about the Saints and what they're like on the road. Sometimes, a lot of times, they go on the road. They're playing on grass. Well, they're coming on the road, brand new stadium, no fans. Um, I think Emmanuel Sanders will have a good game. They'll get the ball, dump and dump it off to Kamara. I think they'll still move the ball. And the kids for the Raiders, you know, Jacobs and uh, Ruggs, uh, Carr did really well. Carr could still make mistakes, I think. Um, that would be a game. I, I would kind of, I, to me, I kind of like the over in that spot, but I, I hear where you're coming from. And you know what? I know we got to move on, but let me just throw it back at you because you brought this point up before, and I'm just picking your brain. The New England-Seattle game, Seattle's laying four. Uh, the total is 45 and a half. Wilson looks so good, and he spreads it around. Now, the Patriots' defense is terrific, terrific secondary. I want you know, was Miami's offense just ordinary, and the Pats look good, and and they kind of went to this. It wasn't a wildcat, but his he only threw for seventy five yards, and they had designed running plays. I mean, do we honestly think that's what he's doing every week? I think he threw that at Miami, knuckleballed them, and but I mean. I think at some point, you know, it's got to come out with a base offense. Um, is it a low-scoring game? I, or I, that's a low total uh, for a Russell Wilson game up in Seattle. And I think I think the Pats can open it up a little bit. They're going to have to. Yeah, I, that's an interesting one. And, and it kind of caught me off guard. And, and first and foremost, I mean, look, Bill Belichick is awesome against the spread. He's, I mean, 60% in his career – and now he's in an underdog role. And it almost feels like Belichick as a dog is kind of an auto bet situation to me. I mean, you got to think he's going to wind up uh, having the right type of game plan here. On the other hand, Seattle got to see some of those designed runs with Cam Newton that they're going to run with the offense. Man, it's a tough one. And, but I will say this. When you talk about the total specifically, you know, with Chung and Hightower opting out because of COVID-19 yeah. for the Patriots – This feels like more of a spot where it can come back to hurt them. I think it's hard for Miami to make that hurt. Seattle probably can make that hurt. So I I agree. I mean, I I think there's a good chance that we get some points there in that Sunday nighter. And the total has gone up from about 44 to 45, 45 and a half. Yeah. And and you mentioned you had somebody said they'd look out the Patriots. I don't know. Uh, It's week one. I mean, did the Patriots... Did they play play to the Miami level, and you know we got you? We're like they were like toying with them, you know. Okay, we're fine. Good to see you. We'll see you again down the road. But were they just toying with them, uh, or is this what we're looking at with New England? That they kind of played down to to Miami's level, got away with it, and now you're jumping into a deeper end of the pool. I, I mean, the jury's out on New England. We we can say Belichick all we want, you know, but you do need the horses, so. Uh, this this is clearly a step up in competition. And don't sleep on uh, – Adam, have you ever been to Seattle? Never been to Seattle. I'm telling you, man, it, that flight out there is the worst. I mean, if you're sitting on the right side of the plane, you're looking at Mount Rainier for an hour and a half. Well, well, are, are, are we there yet? I mean, Let that's... me ask you this. Because if, if Seattle – Let's say Seattle's getting maybe one and a half for home field with that travel, but Seattle's generally a three and a half point home field. If this number is six, 
you know, which is what it would be if there were fans in attendance, you know, the full stadium and all that. If this number is six, does does it make you feel different about it? Because you got to keep in mind that, you know, I mean, these numbers are neutered a little bit, kind of watered down a little bit without home field advantage. And we know Seattle's is one of the best in the NFL. You know, the Patriots catching six, that seems like a lot. Oh, Patriots that, catching four, maybe it doesn't in, feel like as much. And know that the Superbook at the Westgate, Jay Koenig, these guys put up uh, advanced week lines. All right, so the the number for this game last week before game one was played was Seattle minus three and a half. So, I mean, you know, they they like what they saw um, from Seattle. But the number's four. So there's no 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 great reaction or over adjustment there. But I, I I don't know, man. I the Cam Newton thing with the Patriots it was a notch above the Wildcat offense. You know, it was. I mean, albeit don't mess around. You've got the defense can win you games. It's a lot of way to win football games, but it's also one of these things where okay, was that a one off? You know, was that the game plan for that game, or is this what they're going to be trying to do week in week out? If this is what they're going to try to do week in week out, just like the wild uh, wildcat offense went away, you know, get get something on tape here and let's put this thing to bed and force this guy to throw. But it's, no, only week, it's only week two. No, that's true. I mean, excellent points made here by Brian Blessing. We talked about some of our favorite plays, at least early on in the handicapping process here for week two and a lot of analysis of the week two card. We'll have more NFL stuff on ATS.io radio on Thursday with Brad Powers. And of course, make sure you subscribe here to these ATS YouTube videos. Brian, last thing I want to talk about, you did a video. I wrote up a preview. Want to spend a few minutes here talking about the U.S. Open at winged foot. I know both of us very excited to watch this golf tournament. Oh. I, I think the, the biggest takeaway right now, having handicapped it, having taken a look at the course and what people are saying, I am anticipating large amounts of carnage this weekend with very um, thick rough and probably a winning score over par. Over under seven and a half broken clubs. You know, guys uh, how, slam, how pissed slamming off does John, how pissed oh, off John Rom get? Oh my God. I mean, I watched... Um, about an hour and a half last night of the live from the U.S. Open. By the way, it, it's it's an incredible venue. And fall golf, the trees, the colors, are the leaves changing in Cleveland? Uh, they're starting to a little bit. Yeah, oh, it's cool this, off a little bit. this place, the, the, the trees are orangish, reddish, changing. It's as green as green can be. The rough is three to five inches. It is nasty. The last time they played the U.S. Open here, Jeff Ogilvy won at five over par. Another U.S. Open in the past, it was Hale Irwin won at seven over par. They called it the massacre at Wing, uh, Wingfoot. Now, these guys are really good and hit it a lot farther. But, I mean, the winning score is going to be right around par, I think. And John Rahm, in fact, said... He said, I don't think anybody's going to shoot under par. But he said, if someone does, they're going to win the tournament by a lot. <laughs> so that that tells you it's fairways, man. Par is a good score. And uh, I can't wait. It's, it's going to be a U.S. Open in the fall. And it's a remarkable accomplishment for them. to, to the, the, the stuff they had to go through to keep the course through the pandemic, they were you know targeting June. Summer golf, you want the fast, hard greens. Well, now it, you know it would be brown in the summer, but it's, it's gorgeous. But they, what they were able to do to keep the course alive with a smaller superintendent staff because of the pandemic, and the players say the course is just sick. So I, I can't wait to see it. Um, DJ, obviously great form, usually plays uh, great in U.S. Opens using a drying, a driving iron off the tee in the practice round, so we'll see how that pans out. I'm I, I'm going to throw a couple prizes out there. I think Louis Oosthuizen, I think he can hit fairways. He's rolling the rock pretty good. Uh, Louis, his major pedigrees come at the Masters and at uh, the British Open that he uh, won. But there's something about Louis Oosthuizen in majors. I, I can see Louis Oosthuizen. Then guys that hit the fairways, uh, you know, Brendan Todd, um, it could be interesting. But my top pick, man, I feel like an ostrich sticking my neck out. 
is Tony Fino. The guy just he can't kick the door down. You know, he's thirty to one. But he was in the final group uh with Kepka a couple of years ago. He actually contends on hard, fast courses. Uh, so I'm I'm gonna take a flyer that this is this guy's day in the sun. I'll say Tony Fino. No, I mean, this is a challenging handicap because it's a par 70 and it's long. It's going to be almost 7,500 yards here. So you want bombers that can shorten the course, but most of the bombers don't hit fairways. So not, you know, staying away from the rough, obviously, with what we've already talked about and what's been talked about a lot uh, out there in, you know, the mainstream media, staying out of the rough is is a really helpful thing here. So it's tough. You know, I... I actually wound up with a couple of guys that I like here. I'm going to be back on the Daniel Berger train. I, I like him. He hits it a long way. Great ball striker because you're going to have some very long second shots on this course. So I think Berger's a good guy. My favorite player actually here this week, though, and maybe he's not in the greatest of form, but I know he's a guy that you played on a lot earlier on in the season. Webb Simpson? Uh, Tommy Fleetwood. Yeah. I, I like Tommy Fleetwood here. He's... in driving accuracy, tied for 16th in percentage of yardage on a hole covered off the tee, just outside the top 25 in putting. And putting will be a big deal this week, as it is at every major. But these greens are fast, they're sloped, they're going to be very tough. Fleetwood's my favorite play there in that 30-1 to range, also like Berger. And I can't argue with Finau either, who's a guy that does hit it a long way and can shorten this track a little bit too. You know, he's a sneaky... A uh, sneaky play, too. Um, Paul Casey is, is uh, he's learned how to win at least a, a little bit, but he's got a sneaky, sneaky game built for a major. Uh, don't forget what he did at the PGA. The more I'm thinking about it, I think we're nuts not to throw Casey in there a little bit at 50 to 1. I like His, Kisner a little bit, 90 to 1. Uh, a great putter, guy that hits fairways. Yeah. But, uh, the hard thing is, I mean, there are so many world-class players here on what's going to be one of the toughest courses that they've ever played for a major. It's hard to expect somebody off the pace to be better than all of this elite talent. So it's hard for me to throw out a lot of long shots here. Uh, Kisner's a long shot at 90, but really for the most part, Casey's in that, what, 55 to 60 range. That's about as far as I would go in a field like this. Right, and, and, the, the, and your point is well taken. The difference here uh compared to a lot of the golf we saw here in the summer months where a guy can come off the pace like a uh, jim herman you know post a number it's really hard to do that in the u.s open because par is a good score so if you're down five shots teeing off on sunday morning and you start flag hunting man you better be on top of it and and okay if you go low great but the odds are just so stacked that if you get aggressive on a course like this, you're going to get ripped apart. You're going to you're going to take a double. You're going to take a snowman. Something stupid's going to happen. And the guys that are in the final groups, the the leaders, the top three, they're just going to sit there and shoot for the middle of greens and watch the rest of the field fade away, and then turn it into a match play thing in the last four holes. No, that's an excellent point. Lots of excellent points here on today's show from Brian Blessing, the host of Sportsbook Radio and Vegas Hockey Hotline. And, Brian, how can people check out all the stuff that you do? Yep, new to 2 Pacific, KSHP.com. Uh, the shows are archived, sportsbookradio.com. And pretty much you put everything up on my Twitter, at Brian Blessing. Brian, always a pleasure. I know Good to it see was you, bud. an interesting morning here for both of us. I'm glad I we apologize. To... I apologize. I was running late today. I owe you one. No, no, we're good. We're good. I apologize for keeping you so long here. So that we no, could do... I, that, you know, full disclosure, I just, you know, I, whatever. For the first time in eons, kind of slept in a little bit. And, and then I get up and then I lose one of the adapter cords. I mean, if you'd have seen me here, it was like it was like a fire drill. It was, it was a bad comedy act. Adam, Adam sitting back in Cleveland going, who is this idiot? Nah, I would never say that about you as far as you know. <laughs> Yeah, uh-huh. oh, thank you very right, little. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Brian. All right, but, I, I really appreciate right, it, man. Thank you so much for joining me, and uh, we'll talk to you again next week. All right, pal. Always fun. There you go. There's Brian Blessing again, at Brian Blessing on Twitter, sportsbookradio.com, kshp.com, for the great stuff that he does. And we'll be back again on Thursday with a new edition of ATS.io Radio, chatting with Brad Powers, professional handicapper, over at bradpowersports.com. 
That'll do it for me. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. And I will talk to you again on Thursday.